Hey guys, and welcome to another episode. Today in this video, we're gonna be going through more of the Mini Cooper engine rebuild. So I've got my turbocharged Mini Cooper motor and it's not running well. If you guys saw in the part one of the video, I started taking apart a lot of the intake, the electronics found on top, and I've gotta go ahead and remove almost everything that's found on top of the motor so I can remove the cylinder head to see why my engine is not running properly. I have an idea as to why it's not running that well, and today we're gonna to go further into this entire disassembly and continue to rip this motor apart. So in the previous video, we got to go ahead and we got to about this point right here. So we were able to remove the valve cover from the cylinder head and we were able to see all the internals of the head right here. We were able to notice that there wasn't really any damage or anything that was really noticeable from up top in here. So we're gonna continue this disassembly to see what's going on on the bottom side of the cylinder head. My guess is that one of these valves is not making the proper seat on the cylinder head. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this back on there for now. We're gonna go ahead and drain the oil we're gonna remove all the coolant. We're gonna disconnect the turbocharger and the exhaust manifold. And then we're gonna remove the head from the block. There is oil and coolant that circulates through the cylinder head on the bottom side of it, and it also goes in and around the block. It's crucial to drain it before you remove the cylinder head because if you don't, all that fluid is gonna go everywhere and make a big mess. We're going to begin by grabbing an 8mm hex socket and attach it to our half inch driver to commence our oil change. You're going to also need some way of catching all the oil once you remove the drain bolt. Let's begin by going underneath the car and locating the oil pan. On the bottom of the pan you'll find the drain bolt that's keeping all the oil from draining. I personally do not like this location of the hole since you will almost always get oil on you when you remove the bolt, but there's not much that we can do about it. Remove the bolt and all the oil will begin to pour out of the bottom and into the pan. Let it sit for a few minutes to allow as much oil as possible to drain out. Since we aren't doing a full oil change, it isn't necessary to put on a new copper washer on the bolt, but when we top up the engine with oil once the rebuild is complete, we will need to change the copper crush washer for a new one. Reinstall the drain bolt into the pan with the used copper crush washer and then wipe down the pan of any oil. The turbocharger has coolant lines that run through it to maintain operating temperatures along with oil lines to ensure that it's properly lubricated. That means to remove the turbocharger we need to disconnect all four of these lines, two of them for the coolant and two of them for the oil. The meat and the potatoes of the cooling system is found on the front of the engine. The expansion tank is found at the very front with the coolant lines going to and from the thermostat found directly behind it. These all need to be disconnected and all the fluid needs to be evacuated from these lines. Now there's two ways to get that done, the easy way and the proper way. Since we won't be reusing the coolant, I'm going with the more effective approach of just pulling the coolant lines off. Since the expansion tank is the highest point of the cooling system, I'm going to remove that first so that when we disconnect all the other lines, the coolant that's in the expansion tank won't want to flow and drain into the other hoses. There's an 8mm screw that's securing the tank into the front support of the car that needs to be removed. With it removed, we can move the expansion tank out of the way, but don't forget to put the screw back in so that we don't lose it. Next up, we're going to disconnect the coolant lines that are attached to the tank. Beginning with the one found at the top, we're going to use a set of needle nose pliers to remove the little clamp that's securing the hose on. You can slide all of that out of the way and then pull the hose off of the nipple of the expansion tank. Once you have that done, comes the fun part, by removing the hose that's found on the bottom of the tank. Since there's still coolant in there, it's going to be a little bit difficult. Get ready for the fluid to come out as soon as you remove the hose. Plug it with your hand, and then you can either dump the fluid into a container to reuse it, or you can drain it into the catch can that we were using with our oil. You're then going to be repeating this process for the remaining hoses that are found in the engine bay. We're going to continue by removing the one hose that was connected to the expansion tank that's leading to the turbocharger's hard lines. You're then going to remove the clamps out of the way along with the hoses that are attached to the thermostat. Some of the clamps might be a little bit tricky, so if you can get an angled set of pliers or even a hose clamp plier to get them removed, it will make life a little bit easier. Don't forget to get the hoses found on the back side of the thermostat that are connecting the thermostat up to the heater core. You're going to have one leading to the heater core and one coming from the heater core. They're both going to attach on the back side of the thermostat. With every one of those hoses now disconnected, we can remove the three 10 millimeter bolts that are holding the thermostat up to the cylinder head. So there's going to be one found on top, one found on the bottom, and another one found on the front. With all three of those removed, you can just move the entire thermostat and set it aside. 
That completes the disassembly for the cooling system found on this car. Now the cooling system for the N14 and the N18 Mini Cooper motors are the exact same, so this is going to work as a tutorial for both. We're going to begin by removing some of the fuel components such as the fuel pressure regulator, the fuel injector, the fuel rail, and in order to remove those we're going to need to disconnect the fuel line that's attached on the back side of the motor that connects up to the high pressure fuel pump. To remove the nut safely without stripping it, you're going to need a flare nut wrench that grabs on five of the six sides of the nut. So for this car, we're going to be using the 12 millimeter point right here, and you can find this entire kit in the description box. This is a gear wrench kit, and I absolutely love how nice these are. They come in a nice case that you can just take in and out of your toolbox, and it works like a breeze. So to remove this little fuel line right here, there's going to be two nuts, one attached on the fuel rail, and the other one attached to the fuel pump. Put a rag underneath to catch any excess gasoline that's going to be found through that line and it's going to come out once we take the nut off. So you can see that there's a little bit here that's going to come out. If you've driven your car recently, there is going to be a little bit of fuel pressure that's built up inside these lines because this is right after the high pressure fuel pump. It's important to note that once you remove this fuel line, you cannot use it again. You're going to have to replace it with another one. Now the good thing is that it's not too expensive. It's like 40 bucks for a new one, but it's just something to note when you're taking this out. So if you don't have to take it out, don't, but since we're doing a full head and full everything rebuild, we've got to take all this stuff out. Once you take this little nut off, it's going to be disconnected from the fuel rail. Slide it up and then we can get working on the other one. It's pretty straightforward. Grab the same 12 millimeter flare nut wrench that we were using, and then we can disconnect this top nut. Now, once you have the top one removed, we will be able to remove that fuel line that's connecting the pump up to the fuel rail. So since we have all the fuel injectors and the fuel pressure regulator, the sensor for it, since we have all that disconnected, we don't need to remove any kind of electrical harnesses. After that though, we need to disconnect the four T45 Torx bolts that are securing the fuel rail onto the cylinder head. There's going to be four of them that are attached on the back of the block and you need to remove each and every one of those before you can pull out any fuel injector or the fuel rail. Now once you have them all out, it should all come out in one shot. So make sure that you have each and every one of these completely removed before you decide to pull. And the reason is, is that it's all connected. But once you do have them out though, you should be able to lift it straight up and out and the fuel rail and all the fuel injectors should come out in one shot. So you can see that these fuel injectors are looking pretty sad. These are from a 2009 Mini Cooper. So that means that these things are what? Close to 10 years old by now. So you can see that there's a little bit of carbon buildup that's found on the end of each one of the fuel injectors. You can see that they're becoming a little rusty and you can tell that they could do with a little bit of work. So at this point, you can spot the money and buy a new set of fuel injectors. Each one of them isn't that expensive on its own. I think they're something like $70 each, but at the same point, these still work perfectly well. I'm going to take each one of these fuel injectors off of the fuel rail to clean everything up. You can see that even the tips are a little bit dirty. So over the years, a lot of fuel, a lot of junk is going to go through it, and any kind of little particle is going to stick to the end. So I'm going to show you how to clean these up safely so that you can reinstall these in the car and not have to buy new ones. You can see on the end of the tip that there's a couple holes. That's where the fuel is going to be under high pressure, and it's going to atomize into the combustion chamber. You can see that there's a little bit of gunk on there, and I'm going to show you how to clean all this up. So I'm going to start off by cleaning out each one of these tips. So they're all pretty dirty and the way that I'm going to do this safely is using a little bit of gasoline and a rag. So since gasoline is safe and gasoline runs through each of these fuel injectors, it's not going to react in a negative way to each one of the seals or the metal or whatever. It's not going to be damaging any of these at all. So I'm just going to be wiping down the little area that's around there. I'm going to saturate the rag with a decent amount of gasoline so that the gasoline is going to penetrate itself into the fuel injector and clean up any carbon that's in there. This isn't going to be a 100% way of cleaning out the fuel injector, but this will clean out the outside of the fuel injector. To clean the inside of it, we have to mount all this back up in the car, and then we're going to have to run some sort of fuel injector cleaner along with our gasoline to clean out the internals of it. We weren't able to get the inside at this point, but even by spending a couple minutes to clean up the ends of them, you can see that all the carbon buildup is removed, any oil or whatever junk that was on there is now gone. So by looking at it on the outside, it looks a lot better. After spending about 20 minutes cleaning up the entire rail and fuel injectors, like each and every one of these now look fantastic. I'll get a close up in a second, but take a look at these regs and everything that I use. I use a little brush like this, it's a dollar store brush. I trim the bristles on it so that it's a little bit shorter and it's a little bit easier to maneuver. I used an old toothbrush of mine. 
Again, I trimmed down these hairs and a little bristle so that they're a little bit shorter. And I also used a little rag like this. Using a little bit of gasoline and even if you have to, where'd I put it? Right here, a little piece of scotch bright does wonders. Now whatever you do, if you're gonna use this, this is only to make it cosmetically nice. You're not ever going to use this on the actual tip of the injector, ever. Each one of these fuel injectors has a little Teflon ring which basically makes a seal on the end of the fuel injector. Now if you wanna go ahead and take this off to clean everything, all that you're doing is pulling this straight out. So if you give this a little wiggle and you pull it down, you're gonna be able to remove the entire fuel injector. Now what I did to clean each one of these up was slide off this little piece above it, grab the little piece of scotch bright and just went over this entire thing to remove any rust that built up on the stainless over the years. Now these injectors are from this 09 Cooper so they're you know multiple years old. If you do not like the way that they do look, if you don't wanna go through any of this stuff, the price for an injector isn't that bad so if you do want, you can get a whole new injector and it's gonna come with new O-rings that are gonna seal itself into the actual fuel rail and it's gonna come with new Teflon rings down here so it's going to make a perfect seat no matter what. If you guys wanna go that route, it's a very good option, especially if you're gonna be completely disassembling the motor. But if not, what you can do is replace this little O-ring, slide this back in there, clean everything up, and have it looking kind of like this. You can see that each and every one of these um, is a lot cleaner and a lot nicer than how it was. But that's enough for the fuel injector and the rail. Let's set this aside and continue with taking the motor apart. With most of the intake parts removed, along with the coolant components, we can continue to remove the turbocharger's hot side boost tube that's leading to the cold side of the intercooler. That's going to be the last part of the intake going to the turbocharger. After that, there's going to be a hard line for the coolant that's attached to the turbo. There's going to be a 10 millimeter bolt that's supporting it that threads into the cylinder head, which needs to be removed so we can detach the line from the turbo. Moving to the top of the turbo, there's going to be a large 19 millimeter banjo bolt for the coolant line that needs to be removed. Now for the turbocharger, the 19 millimeter banjo bolts, those are for the coolant. The 17 millimeter banjo bolt is for the oil. So just if you're doing this process, keep that in mind. Since we're taking the line out, we need to make sure that both of the washers come with the line and the banjo bolt. If you're planning on replacing your turbo, this would be a very good time to replace this pipe too while you're at it. We can tell that it's getting old by the surface rust that's forming on it. I'm going to be replacing the lines going to and from the turbo for both the coolant and the engine oil, but I'll get into that in a later video. With the coolant return line now removed from the turbo, it's time to remove the other line. So this is the feed line that's coming off of the auxiliary water pump. We need to take off the clamp that's found on the top of it so that we can remove the line from the turbo. If you can manage to get this removed by just using a set of needle nose pliers, that's awesome. But sometimes some of these clamps can be a pain in the butt. So if you have to, resort to using one of those hose clamp pliers. Once you have this removed, we can move up to the top and we can disconnect the 19 millimeter bolt that is connecting the coolant feed line up to the turbo. With that removed, the line itself can be disconnected and we can set it aside. With the coolant lines to the turbocharger removed, now we have to move to the oil lines. So this right here is a 17 millimeter banjo bolt that we need to remove. Again, there's gonna be two crush washers, one on the top and one on the bottom that we need to remove. We're not gonna be able to take out the line just yet, but we can remove the banjo bolt. In order to take out the line itself, we need to disconnect the turbocharger from the exhaust manifold. But I'll get to that in the next video regarding this disassembly. With the oil feed line now disconnected at the top of the turbocharger, it's time to remove the oil return line and that's found on the bottom side of the turbocharger. It's held in place by a 10 millimeter bolt. You're gonna to need to remove that using a long extension in your 10 mil socket and you're gonna be able to push the line out of the way. Now we're gonna be able to re completely remove the turbocharger only after we disconnect the exhaust manifold from the head. That's going to be completing the last part for this video. So as you can tell, we started off with this and now at the end of this video, we're finishing up with this. That's gonna complete it for this video. So we were able to remove all of the cooling system, we were able to remove all the fuel stuff found on the back side of the motor, and we started to get access to the turbocharger. So we removed the lines, and then the next video, we're gonna disconnect the turbo itself, we're gonna remove the exhaust manifold, and hopefully we're gonna be able to get more and more into this build. Because it's starting to get a little cold out, 
Um, working outside is gonna be a little bit more difficult, but I have something in mind for this winter that's gonna allow me to work in here and not freeze my butt off. I'll get into that in a later video, but if you guys have any questions regarding this one, throw them down in the comment section below, and I'd be more than happy to help. Again, guys, thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.